Welcome to a Trek Zone Conversation where we dive into science fiction. Today, returning to the Axanar theme and another guest who has parted ways with Alec Peters, Ken Burnside. Thanks for beaming in. Hey, glad to have you. I'm sorry, glad to be here, man. Well, before we get into it, a quick reminder that you can get behind the scenes goss and early access to all Trek Zone podcasts by becoming a member today. Click the join button on any Trek Zone video, go to the trek.zone slash support or put your phone up to the QR code on screen throughout the show. Ken, firstly, let's talk about yourself. Uh, where did you get started in game design and game creation? So believe it or not, I actually paid for some of my undergraduate university tuition by with a game that I printed it and self-published when I was 16. Um, I made a horrible, awful, terrible, terrible cyberpunk RPG called Renegades, and I have a standard offer. I will pay $20 for a copy of this. I will pay $40 for a video of you putting a copy of this through a shredder and uh, setting the shreds on fire in a wastebasket. <laughs> But it did get better uh, for you. But more recently, oh, it definitely did. I mean, and that, and that game still paid for my first year of university tuition. Um, I'm Ken Burnside. I'm a multiple award-winning game designer, and I'm a Hugo finalist for the Hugo Awards. Uh, if you've uh, read a website called Atomic Rockets, you've probably seen things that I've written because I'm quoted there pretty extensively. And if you've played any kind of spaceship game from about 1990 onwards, there's a very good chance that my name is in the credits somewhere. My most prominent credits have been with Starfleet Battles, and I'm the uncredited co-designer of uh, Federation Commander, which is effectively a new edition of Starfleet Battles that came out about, oh, gosh, oh good gosh, uh, 2006. I oh, know, sure, 2005, so uh, 16 years ago. I've worked as a martial arts instructor. Uh, I've worked as a call center agent. I've done print journalism for science, military affairs, and financial reporting off and on from about 1996 through 2010. When I finally had enough products being made that I could just support myself full time doing game design. Very, very exciting. Well, one of those key games is Squadron Strike. Can you tell us about that? It's a game you launched to mobile app stores in 2014 and have constantly been updating uh, ever since. So Squadron Strike is actually a tabletop game. The, uh, the stuff we've been putting in the app store is a tool called the Avid Assistant, which takes a lot of the clever math that I've put a lot of work into and puts it on your smartphone so that you don't even have to be able to count to be able to play the game. Uh, Squadron Strike is best described as a three-dimensional spaceship combat game, or as I like to say, a flight simulator for people with slow eyesight and bad reflexes. Uh, I'm also best known for uh, publishing a game called Attack Vector, uh, which is basically three-dimensional spaceship combat with all the physics done right. And it's about as close as you'll ever get to a tabletop game that covers the space combat scenes you'll see in The Expanse on Amazon. My games turn a, basically a lot of high school and college level math into color-coded play aids, And the people who buy them kind of expect me to get the math and the science right and to have new ways to use the tools in ways that will explore what the games are about. Well, let's dive into Axanar. Tell us about your introduction to the fan film and what you hope to achieve there. I first heard of Axanar in late 2014 uh, through a post on a web board called Star Rangers uh, Space Combat Forums, where another fellow there by the name of Andrew Bergstrom was releasing metal miniatures based off of a fan film. Uh, a little bit after uh, seeing that, I reached out to Alec in November of 2014 with the idea of saying, hey, I've got a game engine that's really good for licensed space combat. Is there a way we can work out a deal? And he said, sure, that sounds cool. And I believe that you were trying to tie the release in with the feature film release, but the lawsuit happened and got settled a year later. How did you feel while that was all going on? Well, a little bit annoyed because I had gang run the counter sheets for Squadron Strike. Uh, Axonar was Squadron Strike Traveler in March of 2015 before the uh, lawsuit had happened. Then I went to Treklanta to get a feel for the fan film community. You know, I ran a bunch of demos. Uh, pitched one of the settings that I have in development called Exile Stars as a project that could use all of those lovely Star Trek sets. I mean, can you imagine what making fan films would be like if you didn't have to constantly duck uh, the legal actions of the IP holder? It certainly would be a, a very nice feeling, and, and I think that's where the guidelines came in. Now, you saw that settlement agreement uh, that Alec made uh, with CBS and Paramount uh, and even quizzed Alec uh, as to whether you could proceed with Axanar's Squadron Strike. What was it that gave you some pause? Well, the first thing first was that Alec uh, 
used an interesting interpretation. So the settlement more or less says that CBS doesn't own Axinar. It also says that Alec doesn't, know, doesn't own Axinar. So Alec's legal argument for why it was okay for me to do this was if nobody owns it, then nobody can tell me, then nobody can tell us to stop. And so I went along with that, but at the time, first of all, just a brief divertimento, Alec is actually a pretty capable person. Uh, and at least through, you know, the first part of this, um, you know, if anybody was going to successfully crowdfund and make a feature film, Alec looked like the guy who could do it. I mean, look at all the talented people that he brought in. I mean, not just, you know, you know Christian Gossett, Robert Meyer Burnett, uh, some of the other people that he had working in there, Richard Hatch. I mean, just look at the talented people that he managed to pull in. I mean, I'm just, it looked like he might be able to pull this off. I mean, if anybody could make a feature film on a mere $1.7 million, it would be Alec. Uh, so after uh, getting the go-ahead from Alec and seeing his interpretation of the uh, licensing agreement, or sorry, the settlement, not the licensing agreement, um, I went and hired writers to go and uh, you know, write fiction vignettes to tie the scenarios together to build a narrative of the Axonar version of the Four Years' War, which is different from the Casa version from the old, from the old RPG. Uh, my fiction writer that I had for that is Gareth Skarka, and uh, he might be a good guest for you to look up sometime because he's pretty much worked on every Star Trek tabletop product out there from uh, FASA Star Trek onwards. So he's he's been around the block a few times. One of the things that we were trying to do as we were working on the uh, uh, on this document or, or on this product is well, first I also got to do I also got to see the at least tw late 2017 version of uh, the Axar script. Uh, Gareth was looking at it for story beats, for writing fiction, and for finding things that are implied in it that don't show up on screen because that's a lot easier for us to you know, write an interesting scenario about or tell a story that isn't part of what Alec is doing uh, to, to flesh out the universe. Uh, and I was looking at it in terms of counting spaceships and how many were here, were, were here, there, and everywhere else so that I could keep track of what spaceships were built, what spaceships were launched, when they were destroyed, et cetera, and so on. Uh, even got down to the point of actually working out the entirety of how many ships were fighting and doing what at the actual Battle of Axanar. Ken, what was your thinking in terms of the licensing? How does it work for other areas of Squadron Strike uh, that you've released, including the Honor, Harrington, uh, and a couple of others as well, Traveller uh, and Axanar? We sort of was that sort of where it was with that settlement. No one owns Axanar, so it's free to do whatever it likes. That was Alex's interpretation. And the other part of it was that if CBS sent me a cease and desist order, I would show them video of pulping, of pulping all the components. And Alex's take on this was that CBS had been hammering him for the, the first couple, for basically most of 2017 after the license, after the settlement came out. And then Discovery launched and then CBS started leaving him alone. So I think that's also part of what's happened with uh, Alec and all of that. Um, the other thing about this is that when we were doing all of the fiction for the product, we were sending it back to Alec. Uh, and Alec was actually pretty timely on uh, getting on, you know, getting us feedback on the fiction and telling us what to fix and gave very good uh, detailed notes on that for what we needed to fix and all of that. So in terms of the professional side of things, from my side of it doing licensing, Alec was easy to work with. When I do other licenses for things where there is a defined IP ownership that I'm licensing from, you know, we have things like there's a royalty percentage that gets paid. Uh, Alex, Alex settlement with CBS meant that he could not get a that he couldn't get a royalty for this because he didn't own Axonar. Uh, there are you know, there are usually licensing terms and there are usually you know things you are allowed to touch on and things you're not allowed to touch on. After a conversation with Jonathan Lane, I uh, it, it, just before putting out the product in early in March of 2019 or thereabouts, uh, he suggested that you know there's this list of 29 well-known words that all that, that appear in Star Trek, like Vulcan and Cardassian and Klingon and Klingon Empire and Romulan Star Empire and things like that uh, that uh, you really shouldn't use because you know you're sitting here working in a gray area. And uh, why take the risk if you don't have to? So there was a very late editing pass that removed every every mention of the Klingon Empire to the Empire. Uh, there was uh, there was changing every meta, uh, every mention of the United Federation of Planets to the Federation. 
um, the uh, part of the Axonar script that uh, deals with the, the part of the Axonar script that deals with something that's very definitively CBS property, uh, we basically edited around it. Uh, when I was publishing the product, I punched out all the counters for the Constitution class cruiser and the D7. I wanted to ship these off to customers because those were definitely property like of uh, CBS. But all of the ships that were made for Axonar itself, CBS doesn't own Axonar. Alec doesn't own Axonar. Copies were sold, restocks happened, but eventually sales died down. What was the volume like uh, at at the very height? How many uh, units were being sold? Oh, at the very height, um, I was moving about thirty a week uh, for about wow. the first month, and then it dropped to about and then it dropped to about 15 a week for the next month and then it was down to you know five or six a month after that yeah so there was that first hot there was the first hot wave the second month and this is a very common pattern in the board game industry uh it used to be that you could get away with you know making a product and expect it to sell reasonably well for the first six months but there are so many new board game products out there every single month that there's just no time whatsoever for you're going to have that first 60 days, and then after that, you're in the, well, it keeps selling, so we'll keep shipping it. In the end, Alec wasn't very supportive of the project because it was too involved for his tastes, apparently. Chief sycophant Jonathan Lane promoted it once on Fan Film Factor, and it took three days and a post on the Axa Monitor Facebook group to even get them to realise that you dropped the game altogether. Uh, what was the impetus for, for you to drop that game, to, to stop selling it? Well, first of all, just to clarify some things, Alec was buying product as well to sell on the on the Aries web shop. And Alec had a couple of opportunities to play the product while it was in development. We actually went and did a squadron strike uh, retreat in a game store in Atlanta that was actually pretty close to where Alec lived. And he dropped by and you know, shook hands with everybody. And we tried to get him to sit down and actually play. And he just never kind of went for it. Um, he likes playing Warhammer. And I think this was a little bit more thinky than he liked to do for, you know, for sitting down in entertainment. Um, so the basically once the product stopped selling on large amounts, I mean, Alec would buy it, sell it, restock it, buy it, sell it, restock it. Uh, but I had very few interactions from him from you know the release of the product till, until about 2021. And it turns out that the release of the product happened about the same time that he hooked up with Paul Jenkins for doing uh, some for doing some filming. Uh, I did get to see, as did Alec, as did a lot of Alex backers, a couple of, you know, maybe 30 or 40 seconds of uh, some of the stuff that Jenkins had shot uh, sometime in the early winter of 2020. And, you know, they honestly, they looked awesome. Jenkins is very skilled at what he does. I, I still had my hopes then that, you know, Axonar would get made in the two fan, in the two 15 minute segments. So you asked kind of what happened, you know, why, that, why, was, why there was the break. So, um, over the course of running games and selling stuff at conventions since about 2000, um, I've had I basically have incidents of guys getting a little uh, flirty or stalkery with some of my convention staff and the volunteers that I have who work my booth uh, or who work you know, demoing games. And I have always stood up to it because, honestly, it's really obnoxious what women have to go through at science fiction conventions in a lot of, t in a lot of cases. Uh, they're in a situation where it's a no-win situation. If they raise a fuss, they're the. If they raise a fuss, they're hysterical. Uh, if they don't raise a fuss, they get made uncomfortable and driven out of the space. Uh, so it's always something that I've kept an eye out on because I can go in and say things that they can't uh, and rectify a situation. So one of those events where one of my female volunteers kind of got you know stalkered, it got stalked a little bit, or had somebody who wouldn't take no was at PhilCon in 2017, and it involved a man by the name of Jeff Craig. Now, I ended up getting him removed from the convention for some of the things that he pulled. You do not follow a woman into the woman's restroom, for example. Um, and that name had stuck with me. It's, you know, a it's a reasonably common name, but you kind of remember having somebody chased out of a convention because you know, removed from a convention, not chased out, but removed from a convention for following one of your volunteers into a bathroom. So in 2021, uh, as Alec was trying to talk Emmett Plant into producing his audio drama, uh, he told Emmett how awesome the Axonar Squadron Strike product was, uh, trying to basically use me as a credibility boost with Emmett. 
uh, Emmett and I had been chatting a little bit because I had been showing him you know, some of the other gaming related stuff uh, to some Star Trek fans and he was going, huh? Uh, because he didn't have the full context on it. Uh, and, you know, Emmett and I kind of joke and say, yeah, I'm old enough to remember when Alec Peters introduced me to Emmett Plant, you know, to Emmett, you know, to Emmett uh, Plant. Uh, and after that, Emmett and I talked for a bit. Uh, he came in and, you know, went through a game demo and said, well, I kind of wish I'd seen this earlier. I'm, I'm really impressed. And then a fellow by the name of Jeff Craig, who claims to be the chief of security for Axonar, noticed the similarity in names, uh, was an asshole on the Internet to somebody in Star Trek fandom. And Emmett stepped in and said, so, if you're going to pick a fight, here's my address. Uh, let me know when you're showing up so I can work you into my schedule. I guess Emmett is from Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, also known as the city of no fucks given. <laughs> uh, so three things happened after that. Alec made his toxic fandom post that completely mischaracterized everything that went on uh, between Emmett and this Jeff Craig online. And that was kind of stupid because you could go back to the Twitter feeds and read them. The next thing that happened is that the Troll Hunter screen captures came to my attention. You know, the, the, the screen grabs that Axe Monitor has been putting up for a year and a half now that yeah. talks about, that, that shows the, the conversation about Alec trying to get uh, Sean O'Halloran uh, fired from his job. Uh, that uh, eventually Paul Jenkins came in and said, guys, please, please. Please don't do this. I have a professional reputation to, you know, to watch over. Uh, if you keep on doing this, I won't be able to work for you. you know, that, that set of screen captures. And then Alec, um, and, and then I retired the product on June 10th. Just took it off my website, took it off all the places that I sell it, told my retail and distribution partners that I was no longer going to be restocking it for them. Um, and it took Alec three days after the product retirement to notice that it had been retired. It had been shared in the Axe Monitor Facebook group, that Facebook group uh, that he reached out, and he called me a traitor for giving all the haters this ammunition. He also said he didn't care about my people getting abused, and that finalized the break. It does turn out that the Jeff Craig that I got rousted out of PhilCon is, appears to not be the same Jeff Craig who claims to be the chief of Axe our security. That if Jeff says that he has never been uh, to a convention on the East Coast, and I have no reason to disbelieve him. Uh, but, you know, it was just one of those, huh. For somebody who claimed, for somebody who's been talking about how he has been stalked and harassed for six or seven years at this point, the fact that he was okay with somebody else harassing a random person on the internet and his name came off as a little odd. Uh, it also Quite came up, I'd also been aware. Yeah, yeah it might have even been a coincidence. Um, I had been unaware until Alec brought it up in that phone call that he had, uh, that he was involved in legal proceedings with Paul Jenkins, and so I did a little bit more digging. Um, and, you know, had I seen that Troll Hunter screen capture earlier, uh, I'd have canceled the product earlier. When Alec is, this is just a line I do not cross. You do not support people who harass other people at all, even if they're harassing people that you consider your quote unquote enemies. For a, for a Star Trek fan film, it's, uh, Alec certainly has a lot of enemies, it seems. I will say this Alec could shut up every single one of his enemies, and maybe he will. He's promising to do two new film shoots, but he could shut up every one of his enemies by putting that fan film. I mean, if he had put the fan film out that I saw snippets of from Paul from Paul Jenkins' shoot in you know, October of 2019. Everybody would be talking about how awesome Axonar is because exactly. the bits that I saw were just you know amazing. Uh, have you seen the video? Have you seen a, the video tour of Alex set for Axonar for at Airy Studios? Yeah, so much wasted That potential. is an incredible. That is an incredible asset. Mm. Uh, and I have seen how configurable that set is. Uh, it has the it has the, the bridge setup that you see in uh, on the stills for Axonar, but what you don't see is that nearly everything on there is on uh, cast is on lockable casters, and with about 24 hours worth of work, you can rearrange that set and make it look like an entirely different ship. Uh, I think that Alec has plans in there uh, for three different configurations for three different ships. Um, 
and they, they he took a suggestion of mine um, about uh, instead of having all of those gel screens that you have in Trek the original series, he has uh, covers over some you know very nice uh, high definition over some nice high definition TVs. Uh, because the high definition, the high def TVs are bright enough to show up when you film them, and he has those all hooked up to uh, some Arduino boards, uh, so it's really easy for him to you know change the sets. It's an amazing asset, and if the Alec Peters from you know 2014, 2015, 2016 ever shows up again, the guy who's really good at you know getting talented people to be there. To, to there that would be an incredible asset for the fan film community, not just Star Trek fan films, but, you know, the low budget, you know, short budget science fiction films in general. It really is, as you said, a really terrifying waste of potential. Yeah, exactly right. Well, there are about 300 sets of counter sheets out there. You handed them over to Reese Watkins, a, another loyal Axanar mm -hmm. subject, but nothing has come of it so far. We're a couple of months down the track now. Uh, and uh, it just seems to have been shelved and put away and uh, attempted to be forgotten about. Possibly. Uh, I mean, they have they have the counter sheets, and I even sent them updated PDF files that clarified who owns what. That Airy Studios is producing this under light uh, you know, under a license from uh, you know, from Ad Astra Games, and you know if he sold out of the counter sheets and wanted to buy in a new print run, I would you know do a gang run and print them some more of them because it's a good product. But honestly, it is the kind of thing that doesn't get a lot of glory. Uh, and strategically, one of the reasons why I did this, why I sent him the counter sheets via Reese and why I sent them the finals is that I kind of, you know, counted on my fingers how many people Alec has sued or threatened to sue or, or, or initiated legal actions on and went, huh, Okay, we could argue with the settlement that he doesn't own it, that, I, that, that he can't claim it, but you know what? Maybe there'll be a change of heart. Maybe Alec will suddenly stop being the poster child for, oh, if only. Uh, so I sent it on to him. On, you know, make it a clean break. Make it, a, make it as amicable a break as I possibly can. And if Alec wants to put that product back in print, I will even line him up with some print vendors to put up new counter to put up new covers for it. I mean, he's done the PropWorks uh, catalogs, you know, so he knows graphic designers who could make a cover for that product. Uh, I didn't send him the covers online because it has my company's logo and contact information on it. But I suspect what's happened is that um, all in all, I'm just you know not that important to Alec to be you know worth building up the spite and the vendetta, et cetera, on. And I didn't really leave him a lot of traction uh, to go with since I sent him all the parts he needed to, uh, you know, to, to keep the game in print if he wanted to. From my perspective, Axanar was always just one arrow in the quiver. It's only one of my licensed products. It is a product. Um, so it's pretty easy for me to retire it. For Alec and Aerie Studios, Axanar seems to be all he's got, although you know he's now doing a Kickstarter for the Jewish Space Laser Corps. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Just one. kind of missing. Well, Ken, in some notes you sent over uh, before we got recording, you say that Alec never saw you as useful enough, and you know you just sort of alluded to that there. Useful enough to rope into the inner circle, uh, into that troll hunters. With what you know now, is that a blessing? <laughs> yes. <laughs> very, very, very much so. Uh, <laughs> like I said, if I had known about the troll hunters in early 2020 i would have dropped the product in early 2020. um and it you know it does kind of make me sad because it is a good product but i will probably reuse some of those ship design meta you know, metaphys you know, metaphysics things you know or how the how the ships behave in a different product down the road because it really did give the feel of the space combats that you see in prelude to axonar um, admittedly not quite so close because you still have the problem on Prelude that everything has to look good on a screen and that means you have to have the ship that's shooting and uh, the ship that it's targeting either in a jump cut or on or in the corners of the uh, or sorry in the corners of the screen <laughs> shooting at each other so that it's uh, understandable to the uh, you know, to the audience uh, but as I said Axonar is only one quick is only one arrow in the quiver I've got a traveler license 
Uh, I have a product called Romance of the Seven Realms, which is actually what I was talking about when Emmett uh, Plant and I bumped into each other. Uh, Romance of the Seven Realms is uh, Arthurian romance with a dash of heirloom space fighters inspired by 1930s serials, you know, 1930s movie serials. I've got a product in development now called Exile Stars, which I've mentioned before. Um, the elevator pitch for Exile Stars is I want you to imagine Star Trek, the original series, with some updated tech assumptions and some updated sociological assumptions uh, and aliens worthy of C.J. Cherry. Uh, so starting in the late 1970s and into the 19, and into and through most of the 1980s, C.J. Cherry made a name for herself by writing good sociological and anthropological science fiction. Her most famous series is called The Pride of Chanur, uh, which basically is a first contact novel told from an alien uh, from an alien space trader's perspective, with one token human in there who's looking lost and confused and is very confused throughout most of what's going on. And she does uh, alien point of view characters in fiction better than anybody that I've ever seen. So I'm trying very hard to uh, get better aliens than the bumpy head, than the bumpy headed, for, bumpy foreheaded, honors, uh, honorable warriors, uh, or the uh, horrible, horrible for. When I first saw the Ferengi show up in college, I was sitting there with a friend of mine who was Jewish who looked at the Ferengi and just sort of spit at the TV, and she got up and left. And I think we can do better than better aliens than that now. Well, it is fascinating to get to know you, Ken, and uh, hear about your Axonard journey that has taken you to this point. As you say, just one quiver in the bow uh, for you. Um, just incredible. The journey that you've been on, the journey that everyone goes on when they come through the Axonard turnstile, um, just incredible. <laughs> Looking forward to catching Squadron Strike uh, and plenty more than just Axanar there for Squadron Strike as well. So, uh, Ken Burnside, thanks for beaming into Trek Zone today. I really appreciate it. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Keep up to date with Twitter. Catch new podcasts daily on YouTube. Plus, we're beaming to your favourite podcast app five days a week. Just search for Trek Zone and subscribe.